So good afternoon to everyone. I would like to introduce uh, Patrick Ripanger, who is the vice um, president of um, artificial intelligence at Samsung. And um, hello, Patrick. Hi, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for, for being with us. And I would like to also introduce um, Swapan Ghosh, who has organized this talk and who will be the moderator. And I'm handing over to him. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it is our pleasure to. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Patrick Bangard, and he is, as you said, he is the Vice President Artificial Intelligence at Samsung SDS. And uh, today he will discuss how artificial intelligence and machine learning, and that is disrupting the you know healthcare and life sciences industry. And I will be moderating uh, this discussion. If you have any questions, uh, please post it in the chat. And uh, at the end of the discussion, uh, you know, at the presentation, uh, then we will go through the questions as much as possible. And if time permits, we'll answer all questions. Otherwise, we will actually send you the answer, uh, you know, later on. So with that, uh, I, you know, invite Patrick to start the session. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Thank you, Swapan, for your kind introduction. I'll be talking about the use of artificial intelligence in the healthcare and life sciences domain. Now, of course, um, we only have uh, 40 minutes to do it, so it'll be a very rough and quick overview over what it is and some of the application areas. Um, we won't have time to go into any great depth of detail, but um, if you do want to go into detail in something specific, please feel free to reach out to me, uh, either ask a question during this presentation or at a later point, um, reach out on LinkedIn and ask it then. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, um, for all those life sciences people, what is artificial intelligence? Um, so I like this particular quote, um, machine learning or artificial intelligence, they're effectively synonyms these days, is about prediction. Using information that you have to generate information that you don't have. Um, so for instance, an information that I might have is a photograph um, of my skin rash or an MRI a picture of my brain. And the information that I don't have is What's the disease called, right? Is it a benign rash and a little bit of cream will do, or is it skin cancer? Um, and that's the sort of questions that we want to ask artificial intelligence. Now, in creating artificial intelligence, um, what are the sort of steps you have to go through? And I, I like to show this process to get people to realize that making AI is not itself automatic, right? The, the AI product, the final model that you get is an automatic thing. It's a robot. You stick that photograph into it and out of it pops, you have acne. Fine, that's great. But making that model is not uh, an automatic process. It's, it's a fairly laborious uh, human process that consists of seven steps. There are five technical steps, mathematical steps in the middle. Those are the ones that have boxes on the slide. And there are two steps of project management communication that border it on, on either side, right? So in, at the very beginning, there's a communication step by which you find out what exactly is the problem. This is where the AI scientist would speak to the life scientist or the healthcare scientist or the doctors to find out how is this particular condition that we're trying to identify different from others? Um, what are th what's the data basis on which we are supposed to make that decision and so on? Uh, this is fairly complex. Actually, most of the mistakes are being made at that point. At the very end, you have a step of change management where you have to convince people to actually use this. In convincing the general public to make use of a gadget is generally not so hard, but uh, convincing professionals to change their lifestyle um, could be quite challenging. So for instance, convincing radiologists 
to use artificial intelligence to help them diagnose cancers and tumors on MRI scans or CT scans um, is actually a little bit challenging because they feel threatened in their jobs. Um, without going into more detail on that, change management therefore is actually a quite a significant challenge for artificial intelligence. You, you can't just make the model, you have to deploy it in the right way so that it actually gets used. And in the middle, you have these science steps where you have to acquire lots of data, you have to insert uh, domain knowledge into that data, which we call data labeling or annotation. Then you have to tease out the right sort of features um, that, that you want. So going back to the skin acne example, right? Some of the features that you might want to look for is how big are the postules um, of the rash, right? What, what color do, do they have? How elevated above the level of the normal skin are they? All right, so these are the features that you might need to extract from the photograph in order to come to a conclusion about what the thing is. Um, ultimately, you need to tune the machine learning algorithm to the problem, which includes changing the values of several uh, parameters. And they're not easy to tune. Um, for various reasons, there is no process still today after uh, about 70 years of research into AI to do that tuning a priori. It's a trial and error process uh, that is quite time consuming. In the end, of course, you have to train that model and distribute it at inference. Uh, inference means using the model in a, in a practical um, way uh, in the application. In other words, the model needs to be transported to the hospital um, or to the home, depending on where it's meant to be used. And it needs to run on that device. So an MRI scan image model needs to be put on the MRI scanner, right? Or um, you know, a, a, a photograph uh, interpreting model could go on your mobile phone. Um, and so that, that deployment process is again, complex. Typically speaking, end to end, we're talking about four to five months of work for a team of several people, including both domain experts, that is to say, um, life scientists, healthcare specialists, as well as AI specialists. So it's, it's a bit of an effort. Just pointing out most of the work, human work happens at the very beginning with the data. And the later steps are typically speaking computational steps that take a long time for the computer, but not that much more time for the, for the people. So that gives you a very rough overview of what it takes to make AI. Let's jump into what it can do in, in healthcare, or rather what it does in, in healthcare. So there are four main areas in the near and the long term where AI is, uh, is being used and, and will most likely be used in, uh, in healthcare. The first is diagnostics. Um, that's what I was talking about before, right? You get a picture and you ask, what's the disease? Um, Diagnostics is, of course, um, very attractive because, as you all know, a, a member of the general public, after five minutes on Google, um, they end up knowing that they will die tomorrow. Um, no matter what you've got, um, a five-minute Google research will conclude that you will die very soon of some horrible disease, right? So we need a reliable method of uh, diagnosis both for the consumer uh, of, of healthcare products, as well as, of course, for, for professionals. Um, also something that um, many people don't like to talk about is that the accuracy of diagnosis for the average, and I stress the word average, professional physician is about 70%. Um, that means about 30% of the diagnoses that you get at the hospital, at the doctor's office are not correct. Um, so having a second line of defense 
um, by artificial intelligence to give you an immediate second opinion is not a horrible idea. Um, the second area is drug discovery. Um, it is uh, enormously expensive and very time consuming to produce a new drug. Um, we've seen uh, in recent times, obviously, that the vaccine for COVID-19 uh, was produced at a stellar speed, um, but nonetheless, it took a year. Um, and the resources that were uh, made available uh, to make that COVID-19 vaccine were unprecedented resources, um, and it still took a year. Um, for a normal, uh, quote unquote normal uh, disease, it takes 12 years to develop a drug and it costs uh, almost $3 billion uh, to make that, to design that, that drug. Uh, people are hoping um, and it's, it's turning out quite, quite well that, that AI will help make that a lot faster, make it a lot cheaper. Then drug development, um, this is after you've discovered it, um, developing it, making it more applicable to personalized medicine, taking into account your own um, body specific needs is something that is currently uh, being, being driven and it's, it's very um, promising. And lastly, it's the workflow, right? So doctors and healthcare professionals um, are also people uh, working in an office environment, having challenges um, of many kinds other than actually practicing medicine with the client, with the patient. And so a number of tools would help them do their, their everyday job. So those are the four areas that I'm going to focus on. And just to um, say this, healthcare AI is something that has given rise to numerous publications. These are all books, um, and there are plenty more that, I, I, that won't fit on the slide. Um, there is a journal um, on uh, life science AI. So, um, you know, me talking about it now is, is really nothing other than the table of contents for the literature that you will find out there in the world. So if you're interested in this in more depth, um, please visit a bookstore and you will find more than you wanna know. Now in diagnostics, uh, just some examples, um, it's possible to uh, detect whether or not you have COVID-19 based on an X-ray of your lung. So all you need to do is lie under an x-ray machine, get it done, and immediately it's possible to diagnose whether you have COVID, pneumonia, or, or you have a normal lung. And you might be interested to know that the accuracy of that test is higher than the chemical nasal swab test. Um, so it's actually more reliable and it doesn't require uh, any chemistry. It doesn't require any time. And of course, x-ray machines are available everywhere. Now, uh, I live in California. Um, if I go down to the local hospital, which takes me five minutes, this is not really a problem. But um, in rural places, in third world countries, uh, where the availability of swab tests isn't that great, where the chemical laboratory uh, environment is not that great, x-ray machines are always available. Uh, they're old world technology. Um, and so models like this uh, can be extremely helpful in environments that are not uh, super advanced. You can find brain tumors on CT scans, um, again, immediately. Um, you can interpret uh, slide images. This is where you, when you go to the doctor, they're not quite sure whether what you have is cancer or something else. They take a little biopsy um, and put it under a microscope. And then they look at, um, at the tissue at a cellular level. Um, the result is a, a slide image, um, and you can use artificial intelligence at the cellular level, again, to detect whether or not uh, what you're looking at is cancer, in, in this case, breast cancer. Um, 
and uh, breast cancer happens to be a very difficult disease to diagnose. Um, it, it mimics um, other conditions that are not, uh, not as troublesome. Um, and uh, another example is colon cancer. Um, you can get a colonoscopy, which is a, a video. So an actual video camera is, is inserted in the colon. Um, and then out the other end comes about a 20 minute um, video feed. Um, again, state of the art is a doctor watches the video and then tells you whether or not you've got colon cancer. Um, that, of course, first of all, takes time. The doctor has to watch it and interpret it. And um, it is error prone because it's, it's a video, right? There are a few frames where you have that little uh, cancerous nodule. The doctor may miss it. Um, the AI can, again, um, analyze that video in much less time than the 20 minutes, uh, more or less instantaneously and give you a quite reliable result. So here are some, some examples where AI is already doing that. Um, and I'm presenting you models that my group made. Uh, they, there are many more models, of course, available for different sorts of diseases. Um, they are available. Um, a very noteworthy point um, in the diagnostics area is that this is all dependent on labeling of images. So uh, with these image diagnostics, what you need is a library of tens of thousands of images of the condition and also of the same environment without the condition. And then somebody, of course, a trained doctor again needs to come in and identify these are the images with the condition and perhaps this is exactly on the image where the condition is located and these are the images without the condition. So that is image annotation and is very time consuming. State of the art is that all the images are annotated by hand by a person, um, but there is artificial intelligence research um, called active learning which can reduce the amount of human labor by up to 80%. Um, that doesn't only make it cheaper and faster to develop this AI, it's an enablement technology that allows us to make models uh, for conditions that previously were economically inaccessible. Um, so that means that through technologies like this, which are AI that helps to make more AI. So I, I like to say AI squared um, that actually make life easier and um, make proliferation of AI in healthcare uh, much easier. So let's go on to the life sciences where we talk about drug discovery. So um, you can imagine that uh, a, a disease or a condition is like a lock um, and you need a key for it and um, that is the, the drug. Um, so to speak, it, it's at the molecular level that um, the disease has receptors and you're trying to design a molecule, uh, the, the drug, that correctly fits uh, into that scheme. And there are uh, five stages as we illustrate here at the bottom of the slide that are needed to, uh, to first of all, actually, actually discover and then make sure in various uh, testings and selectings that it really works. Uh, and of course, we have to document that to the FDA in, in the United States to uh, certify that it actually works. In every single stage here, artificial intelligence can help. Um, again, I emphasize help, uh, right? Artificial intelligence will not just do it, um, but it, it will help or it is helping to, um, first of all, reduce the amount of human labor involved. Um, it does the uh, data analysis. And so it, it can speed up uh, the process of finding um, the, the right thing that that will that will fit into any part of analysis so ultimately uh, there is a lot of searching 
uh, going on that AI can, can help with, which is ultimately a mathematical optimization algorithm. Um, so think of it like, like this. Um, you are in the mountains. You've never been there before. Uh, you unfortunately don't have a map either, and it's misty, so you can't see very far. Um, but your task is to find the highest peak uh, in that mountain range. But what do you do? So since you don't have a map and you can't see very far, you don't know that the highest peak is right over there. You need to find out by experimentation and trial and error, by hopping around the area and learning about the topography and then making a hypothesis that maybe it's over there and then going and verifying that, right? That's how we do science. That's how we find this uh, molecule that correctly fits into the molecular receptors of the condition. And artificial intelligence is very good at optimization problems like this. It will prevent you from hopping around your uh, range of mountains uh, arbitrarily, and it will make sure that you do that trial and error with a very specific targeted plan that at the end of it will work out and, and will make you um, hit that target of course, with as few steps as possible. Again, shortening the amount of time and human labor. Um, it's projected that AI will save about 70% um, both of time and money sunk into the about $2.8 billion required to find a new drug. Um, so that will be of, of significant help here. Um, one major advance that I want to point to was made in December last year, so this is only half a year ago, a company called DeepMind um, in the UK developed a computer program called AlphaFold. Um, you might know them more popular by their program called AlphaGo, which played the Japanese board game of Go very well and, and beat all the grandmasters which of course is a fantastic accomplishment, but it, it is a board game. And they developed uh, six months ago, the Alpha Fold system, which um, is the first system in existence that can correctly uh, predict the protein folding process. So if you know the genetic sequence um, of a protein, Alpha Fold will calculate the three-dimensional structure that that protein will take in real in vitro conditions. That was an unsolved problem and it, it's, it's uh, somewhat the holy grail um, in, in healthcare, of course, because it is the three-dimensional structure that actually represents the, that, that key that I was talking about, right? That, that's the uh, shape of the molecule. And if you can calculate the shape of the molecule rather than have to experimentally, biologically uh, find it out in experiments, you can save a huge amount of resources and time to design the shape of the molecule properly to fit into the receptors of your disease. So I think this technology, it's only six months old, but I think this technology is going to open a lot of doors for drug discovery. Precision medicine is another area where AI um, is helpful. Um, right now, of course, uh, as you know, there is medicine available um, and it's simply being given to everybody. Uh, and in the future, um, precision medicine would say, okay, that there is this medicine and then we take into account your personal DNA, right? Uh, not you chunked into a group, but, but actually your DNA specifically. And now we will um, make certain adjustments to that medicine for you personally. Um, the simplest adjustment is of course dosage, right? Um, th and that's what's shown here. Patient A gets the full pill, patient B gets half the pill, patient C has to take twice the pill. Um, dosage is one of the simplest ways to adjust uh, the drug delivery uh, to an individual. There are, of course, multiple others. Um, so for example, uh, if, if a doctor prescribes <clears throat> antibiotics, there is a whole range of different antibiotics that are available. 
uh, this one might suit you better than that one. And that again is an example of personalized medicine. And it will be uh, an AI model that will decide, uh, that will have to decide um, based on your, uh, your DNA or your personal needs, which one is, is most relevant to you. Um, so predicting, for example, which genes um, or which phenotypes uh, and so on are most relevant to the drug. Um, where are there interactions between this gene and that gene that lead to either a higher receptivity to a certain drug or an allergy to the drug? All of that an analysis is so high dimensional and so complex that it's really only artificial intelligence that will be able to handle that. So watch out for precision medicine. I, I think that's something that in the next five years will gather a lot of momentum. Um, then we're talking about devices. Um, obviously uh, on the consumer side of things, you have a lot of devices that are available um, in the home, right? There's fitness trackers like this that measure your pulse. And on the base of measuring your pulse, they do all sorts of wonderful things like tell you how many calories you consumed, uh, whether you ran or you jogged and whether you, know, you should run faster or slower to, to become uh, more healthy. There is a multitude of, of machines that you can buy um, privately for your home and to come to conclusions uh, about your, your, your health. Um, in the hospital and the doctor's office, there are many, many more machines that are augmented by AI. We already spoke about the diagnostic instruments like the MRI scanner, the CT scanner, you have the ultrasound. Um, and speaking of ultrasound, um, I just uh, remembered there's some, some positive stuff, right? So this doesn't always have to be diagnosis of diseases. With an ultrasound scanner, you can look at an unborn baby. Um, and we all know it's kind of difficult to uh, find the baby on the ultrasound, right? Um, all the parents are looking at this diagram thinking, where's the kid? Uh, AI can help with that as well, right? AI can detect um, the, the, the baby. It might be able to, at a later stage, count the fingers and count the toes, make sure a baby's all right. Um, things like this are, are, are helpful, um, even on an emotional level for parents. Um, AI, of course, heavily uh, cooperates with robotics. Um, and so surgical robots are a thing these days. Um, surgical robots to assist the actual surgeon and it's going all the way to surgical robots performing the operation on you completely. Um, there are uh, numerous companies making these robots and of course the uh, software that drives them is, is uh, largely related to artificial intelligence. Let's talk quickly about the workflow. Um, so I, I have this little cartoon and I'm going to talk slower for a moment for people to be able to to read it. Um, at the end of a session with the patient or at the end of the day, depending on when the doctor has a little more time available, uh, doctors need to do something called coding. And coding is a process by which the doctor inputs into the computer what they did um, for their patients during the day and how long it took them. Uh, coding is a methodology for invoicing and billing the insurance company of the patient. So it has nothing whatsoever to do with the actual healthcare for that patient. It has to do with the finances. And it turns out in a representative survey being done at, at doctors that um, doctors spend 27% of their time, a quarter of their time with patients. The other three quarters of their time is spent doing um, office work, desk work, and uh, coding. Coding itself, so merely the entering of what I did this day <clears throat> for billing 
occupies between 1.5 and 2 hours every day for the average physician. So you can recognize that out of an eight hour day, um, the one and a half to two hours a day, that's, that's a quarter of the, a doctor's life spent effectively in invoicing people. Um, that is a workflow that's just not right. Um, and um, as you know, from various AI related toolkits in, in your office, um, there is a term called the future of work, um, which, which kind of is a grab bag for all of these work uh, office related AI tools that are meant to augment and automate the office process. That will be extremely helpful for doctors in their real life to be able to automate the coding, automate the invoicing and billing and office documentation and electronic health record updates and so on. There are technologies that are relatively simple that have been available for years, like the voice recognition, right? If, if I speak, then the computer recognizes what I've spoken and can interpret it. So for example, if I speak to the patient while I'm treating the patient in the meeting, the computer could listen in on it and on the basis of some of the words I say could interpret, first of all, what I'm doing. The computer could clock me how long this is taking and should on that basis be able to automatically without any help by the doctor code that work freeing the doctor up and of course, beneficial for the hospital, coding immediately. There's no time lag there. So that should save up a lot of time. And there are multiple other such challenges. Um, I wrote up a list of, of 13 items. Um, you could make that list quite a bit longer, um, but these are some of the office challenges that uh, doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals are experiencing starting with simple stuff like scheduling meetings with patients, booking rooms, uh, and so on. These are some of the daily challenges that, that doctors have that you don't think about when you think life sciences and healthcare, but actually scheduling and booking are some of the primary time sinks that, that real people in real life have, and AI is, is great for that. So, um, a personal story, I recently, three months ago, got myself an app that allows people to book meetings with me. And I have to say, I'm in love with this app because it prevents me from writing about 30 to 40 emails a day saying when I'm available and negotiating times of the day. It's extremely simple but it saves me about half an hour a day. And as I said, about 30, 40 emails a day, simple little apps like that. Um, they are artificial intelligence. They are extremely helpful. They may not be rocket science, but they too are part of the workflow and of, of, of helping people out in being able to focus on the core of their career and for healthcare professionals, the core of their career is the patient and not um, all this other associated um, work on the side. Now, what's the future gonna look like? What we need to know about artificial intelligence that um, like spirituality, it's about the journey and not the destination. That is to say, AI is never done. Once you have a model in your hand, that's not the final product because you will need to deploy it in the world. You will find that in certain conditions, your model does great. And in certain other conditions, your model doesn't. And then you need to figure out what are these conditions where the model is not performing well. You need to collect more data from those situations bring them back to your central research facility and retrain the model and redeploy it. You might find that you need to split and make two models instead, a model for that group of people and a model for that group of people and so on and so forth. Um, and so the, the loop of the model life cycle 
or another keyword for your Google search, MLOps. MLOps is another word for the uh, operational process of making machine learning models in a, a never ending loop of making it better and splitting models into their various application areas. Finally, I want to leave you off with, with, a, with a positive note. This is my personal opinion. Um, I didn't get this from anybody else. My opinion is that what we have today is actually not healthcare. What we have today is sick care. Um, in other words, people get sick, they have uh, issues of some kind, then they go to the health system and they get diagnosed, they get a drug to make it better or some treatment to make it better. What we really should do and what I think the future is, is genuine health care. That is to say, we should not wait for people to get sick and to develop some pain somewhere. We should rather develop tools and instruments to help the ordinary person at home by him or herself in their own house to stay healthy so that they never even have to go to the hospital. And so there needs to be a transition of focus from focusing on doctors diagnosing diseases and prescribing drugs to looking at giving responsibility to the individual, watching out for their diet, their exercise, their lifestyle, um, and in that way, preventing them from ever getting sick in the first place. Uh, and AI can help a lot with this. Um, first of all, via wearable technology like a fitness tracker and many others. It can also help uh, via apps that are on your phone or on your computer to give you suggestions. You know, hey, you haven't moved for the last few hours. Why don't you go for a walk? Um, you know, things like that. Or, hey, you know, uh, I saw with my mobile phone a camera device that you ate two burgers for lunch. That may not be a great idea. Why not get a salad? You know, that sort of thing. It's fairly simple minded, but this is what AI can provide to, to you as an individual, <clears throat> keep you on track um, and, and stay healthy. I think this is the future and why, it, why isn't this the past? It's because we didn't have tools like this available. And the entire burden was on the individual and their own mind and, to keep this in mind constantly and to do it. And that's an expectation that we all know is simply too much for all of us. And I include myself. I need reminders and AI can provide the reminders targeted to me and my lifestyle and my uh, schedule in such a way that those reminders become realistic and not just annoying. So I think what we will see by AI in the life sciences and healthcare is a transition by which we help, of course, the doctors to do their job and to take care of us when we're sick. But even bigger than that, I think we're gonna see a transition to genuine healthcare where people will, will stay healthy. And with that, I say thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions and again, if you want to reach out to me, LinkedIn is the place and you'll find me there. Thank you. Yeah, any questions here? Yeah, Patrick, I, I have a question. Since you know, most of our you know, group members, we are you know, management student or management scholar. So we are actually interested to know, like say whether AI in healthcare, whether you know, coming up with new business model or whether it is fostering more entrepreneurship. So if you can you know, give us some, you know, uh, some of your thoughts in those areas. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as I've illustrated, AI has many application areas throughout entire healthcare, right? Um, making the drugs, helping the patients in the workflow. Uh, there have been many, many startups um, in the recent couple of years uh, in any of those domains. And those startups have gotten several billion dollars of funding. 
Um, so just in the last quarter, Silicon Valley has given $2.5 billion in venture capital funding to new startups in this area, AI for healthcare in the quarter, right? Two and a half billion in one quarter. So you can imagine how much money is being invested um, in this area. So if you have a startup idea, um, then chances are uh, quite high that you will be able to raise money uh, for it. And of course, also find users for it. The, the uh, bigger hospital chains, the insurance companies, uh, the doctor's offices are uh, interested in trying out these technologies and they're very receptive to it. And so you will find both the venture capital as well as the customer base uh, to, to do that. And I'm, I'm speaking from a, a Bay Area, Silicon Valley perspective here, of course, but um, I know from many conversations with my friends that the same is true elsewhere uh, in the United States, elsewhere in, in Europe. Um, and also uh, China is, is quite active in this area, both in terms of the VC as well as in terms of the use. So uh, this is a very much growing area. Okay, thank you. A any other questions? If I may ask, um, I would like to ask a question as well. I mean, you have listed a long list of benefits of using AI, but clearly um, there are also some um, issues with uh, companies using AI. Yeah? So one of them you have mentioned that uh, professionals are reluctant to use it because they are maybe worried about their jobs. The other um, concerns might be that um, it is very costly. Are there any other um, um, barriers to using AI? Yes, of course. Um, so uh, actually those are the easy ones, uh, right? Uh, people being afraid of losing their job, there are easy ways to reassure them. Um, AI cannot take over the world. Um, so AI will always be, and I, I insist on this, will always be an assistant. It will never take over. Um, in the healthcare domain. Um, now, beyond that uh, and its cost, um, of course, every AI model has an, an accuracy that is less than 100%. Um, of course, so does the doctor. But um, culturally, on a human level, we are much less tolerant of errors made by AI than of errors made by a human. So if I go to a doctor and he gets it wrong, or she gets it wrong, and I get a second opinion, then I'm less angry and more in the discovery mode. If I go to an AI and I get a wrong diagnosis, um, that's, uh, that's more troublesome for us. Uh, emotionally, psychologically, uh, we have much higher expectations. But it's something to keep in mind. Um, every model will produce false positives and false negatives. Um, it's merely a question of how many, uh, hopefully there are very few of course, um, but they will. So that's definitely a, uh, well, maybe not a danger, but something to keep in mind. Um, systems aren't perfect. Um, then there is, uh, or there are two points which are very prominent in AI discussions these days. They're known as explainability and AI ethics. Um, explainability is the desire for the AI model, not just to give you the output, but to give you a reasoning of why it gave you that output in a way that's hopefully somewhat understandable to the person who receives the output, right? So a uh, simple example, you go in the MRI scanner and by the time you get out of it, you have a brain tumor diagnosis by AI. Now that's not very well received, right? Now you're, you're going to feel uh, bad. You're gonna feel shaky. Um, you will want to know how reliable is that diagnosis and on the, how, how did you make it? Why do I have a brain tumor, right? So there are obvious cases like there's a huge lump uh, on, on that MRI scan and you're just in trouble. Um, but there are many, many edge cases, we call them edge cases where it's not obvious, um, where you will have to have 
um, some models point you to a specific area and point out how that is unusual and different from others and so on. So being able to explain the output is a major challenge for AI, especially when uh, you know, people are concerned at the other end. So that we have to work on. Ethics is another one um, where sometimes models are being misused. Um, I don't have a good example in, in uh, life sciences right now, but facial recognition uh, for policing is a very popular example these days. Um, virtually all facial recognition systems have been trained on Caucasian faces. Um, and there's a preprocessor in there for the shape of the eyes and the shape of the nose, which therefore doesn't work very well um, on people whose face looks a little different, people with African descent and East Asian descent whose noses are, and, and eyes are slightly different shape. And so you'll find that facial recognition uh, performs very poorly um, on African and East Asian faces while it performs quite well on Western faces. Um, so there's an example of it simply being unethical to use a model trained on one population and, and deploy that model on another population. Shouldn't do that. Um, and I believe that uh, the same will be true in, in healthcare AI in, in the near future where there will be some um, misuses, whether accidental or intentional, where we need to really watch out that we're doing the right thing. So those are some of the challenges, um, but they are no different than the other challenges that we have in the healthcare system already anyway. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if not, yeah, thank you, Patrick, uh, for your time in early morning. And it is very, you know, I also learned a lot uh, from your presentation. So we will actually, you know, post it. And then if you have questions, then, you know, they will contact you directly through LinkedIn or through your email. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. Take care. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, okay. Thank you, Papan. Thank you very okay. much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.